Sitting from room Italy, when you look at the Chinese economy, I mean, under this uh, against this global backdrop, uh, how do you characterize the current state uh, for the Chinese economy? Well, we do a couple of things. So first, uh, I am uh, always uh, and more and more staying away from talking about the global growth because uh, it used to be a nice indicator when uh, the world kind of. Uh, moved pretty much uh, together with each other. Now with the decoupling, which is not just a supply chain decoupling, geopolitical decoupling, but it's, it's mostly a decoupling of performance. So world growth, world average uh, kind of uh, start to lose meaning. Uh, within this context, so I've always argued that China always offer resilience uh, to any uh, crisis. Uh, the reason is because uh, the investment uh, represents a high proportion of uh, GDP in China. It's around 40 percent, uh, one of the highest in the world and the highest of the biggest countries, biggest economies. And so this means that the government has always uh, a extra leverage to fill any gap coming from consumption or external surplus trade so that it can achieve pretty much any at least nominal GDP growth than it desires simply by uh, adjusting the investment uh, level to fill that uh, missing uh, gap. And therefore, this is something that uh, European economies don't have because investment to GDP is only 15, 18%. The investment within our country is also done by private sector. So we don't have that leverage. So we are almost passive recipient of uh, GDP, while in China, I think the GDP is more like an input uh, rather than an output. It's like a target, a budget. And therefore, in terms of global, we see Asia in general performing very well or relatively well, like we have seen during the COVID crisis and the West is struggling. We have a war, we have lots of supply. We also have coming problems from grain supply crisis in Africa. We face migration. We have geopolitical tension even within Europe, within European countries, between Europe and the US and of course with Russia. So China is, relatively speaking, much better sheltered. It looks like that uh, there's still strong uh, demand, strong need uh, for the essential goods in the manufacturing in China, in other parts of the world. There is. Uh, and uh, do you remember just before I talked about this decoupling of uh, uh, performance? Uh, in a way, China can find itself in a nice, natural, hedged position. Because while on one hand, China wants to move more the value chain and produce a value-added product, uh, most of the exports still remain uh, relatively low added value. And this is what uh, countries in economic crisis really need, because uh, China, in a way, exports uh, deflation. So relatively low-cost goods uh, can actually have an inverted demand curve in uh, Europe. So even if Europe suffers uh, relatively to China, in terms of overall economic terms, like I just said before, they may actually need more of those uh, Chinese uh, cheaper, so to speak, imports uh, to sustain uh, the economy. Because in that case, uh, uh, imports are not competing with the uh, local industries, so they are not the bad type of imports. But there are uh, imports that we need, like spare parts components for our value chain. So these are the good imports that we need. And the cheaper they are, uh, the better. And so relatively speaking, China can sustain a continuous external demand for its uh, uh, product. So in a way, the combination of that domestic uh, positive structure, the, the high level of investment, and the fact that the demand for Chinese goods still remain, I think it gives uh, China another, another hedge. Having said that, uh, let's remember that uh, uh, export to uh, GDP in China has also been falling uh, from around 30% back uh, in 2010 to around 17, 18% now. So uh, again, something that maybe Western analysts don't uh, pick up on, uh, China's reliance on external demand on export uh, has been going down. Obviously, in the speak of inflation, um, you know, countries' economies more or less will be affected probably is really about to what a degree, uh, in particular by the U.S. policy changes uh, to increase uh, the interest rate, for example. How will that affect uh, you know, both the developed, probably, you know, mostly the developing world too? It's a tricky situation because uh, I think many central banks, uh, the Fed, but even more so the European Central Bank, uh, have fallen into the trap uh, to kind of associate the higher inflation. How do I fight it? I increase interest rate. 
And this is uh, uh, completely wrong. So they are making a big mistake, especially the European Central Bank, because the inflation that Europe is facing is uh, uh, inflation due to imports of high prices of oil and uh, gas from uh, uh, Russia. Uh, caused also by the sanctions. So in a way, the EU is also at fault for contributing together with the world to this increase in prices. If you increase interest rates, uh, you do not affect uh, the price uh, of uh, imports because uh, we are not facing inflation because of a high, hot economy that we need to cool down. I think that the European Central Bank is kind of stepping back a little bit and uh, using a narrative that is easing a little bit the bond market that have uh, uh, shot up, uh, of course. The U.S. is slightly different because it relies less uh, on uh, Russian imports, uh, but the narrative is also that uh, the inflation is uh, because of the war, because of Putin. But I see this more as a political tool. Politicians, uh, let me tell you, because I was one of them, do do tend to uh, find uh, external monsters uh, to blame so they can uh, uh, fight uh, beat them and be the hero back at home. So uh, the narrative uh, may be disconnected from the reality and it's very easy and good. If I was Biden, I would probably do that, uh, blame the war, Russia, the wheat prices, oil and so on to uh, justify in ex post faction some uh, domestic uh, weaknesses and problems like the inflation. But Mm -hmm. let me just be clear, the ECB is making a big mistake. China has tried a, a balancing policy, let's say, on one hand, uh, trying to control the pandemic, on the other hand, to grow the economy. How, how do you see it? Is it doing OK or, you know, there's a lot more probably for, for Beijing to do? I think the approach that I liked is that the lockdowns have been in rotation. So they have hit only a few cities at the time. And uh, China has somehow managed to, to, to manage this rotation by having the rest of the country kind of uh, uh, work and fill the gap. Uh, so the pain has been felt uh, locally and a lot. You know, we all know that the Shanghai has been in town for uh, almost uh, two mo- more than two months. And of course, uh, if you talk to people in Shanghai, they would say they've been hurt, companies have closed down. Uh, it would be, be difficult to, you know, for people to re-go back to the original situation because there are also factors uh, that change a little bit the structure of the economy. Maybe people leave, they don't come back. Some small shops don't have the finances to stay open and maybe they close uh, for good. So they are localized uh, pain and sometimes very deep. But overall, I think uh, the system uh, holds on and uh, with the other parts of the country to, to make up for the, for the, for the lack. The, the problem is that we don't know if this policy is going to go on for the rest of the summer or even into the autumn. And so this creates uncertainty. So even if uh, there is no lockdown in, uh, I don't know, City X, uh, uh, there will be some things uh, from investors uh, to to do or open up activities there because you never know. Maybe someone has COVID three or four blocks away and the whole city gets in lockdown. So uh, I think it would be good if the government uh, uh, clarified, but it's also very challenging uh, how the zero COVID policy can be uh, relaxed a little bit or what are the rules so people know the rules of the game. Mm-hmm.